In his best-selling 2014 book, Homo Sapiens, Yuval Noah Harari discusses a history of humankind. And one of the most important ideas at the core of this book is the importance of words and stories. The words and stories we use as humans are the master key that unlocked our potential as a species. Whether that's your religion, your nationality, or the company you work for and the mission that company has, our ability to get each other behind an idea is fundamental to what has made us as successful as we are. Now, I know some of you are furiously checking your agenda now, wondering, are you actually in the right talk? And this is going to be a talk about event-driven architecture, I promise. And there's a link here. And the link is that an event-driven system lets you tell the story of your business through its technical implementation. The language of your business is what drives its functionality. It's a fundamentally a communication pattern, whether that's the communication between two services or the human communication when you're talking to each other about what it is that your system does. And that's what you're going to learn about in this talk. You're here to learn the secrets of event-driven architecture, some of the patterns and practices, and some real tangible and practical things you can take away to build event-driven systems yourselves. I'm James Eastham. I'm a senior cloud architect at AWS. And for any of you not working with AWS, don't worry. This is not going to be death by AWS service icon. This is a really simple talk that's simply about boxes and simply about lines. Yeah, it's one of those kind of talks. And I want to start by being really, really honest with you all, actually. I've built event-driven systems in the past. And I've got them horribly, horribly wrong, like really badly wrong. And that might feel like a really odd way of starting a talk, because now I'm up here on stage telling you all how bad I am at building event-driven systems. But how many of you have ever built a system that has gone wrong, that has failed? It's a safe space. You can put your hand up. OK, cool. Almost everybody. And how much did you learn from that failure, that thing that went wrong? Because we learn so much more in failure than we do in success. One of my old mentors always told me this all the time. We used to literally go into sales meetings with customers and say, we are going to do this better than you can because we've got it wrong more times than you have. So that's what I want to share with you today, some of the things that I've learned building a vendor and systems so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that I do. Now, there's one thing I love talking about almost as much as serverless and event-driven systems, and that is pizza. How many of you here love pizza? OK, anyone with your hand down? Really? Really? So for the rest of this talk, you're all now going to be developers as part of a completely fictional pizza delivery company called Plant Based Pizza. And you're going to take your existing microservices architecture, and you're going to make it event driven. And this is a really high level look at what your system does today. You've got this core order processing service. This is the core domain. This is the thing that holds all the business logic. It what, of course, allows people to place orders and get pizzas delivered to them. But you've got all these other ancillary services around the outside. And all these things have a hard dependency on the order service. And now you need to add a loyalty point service as well. And to do that, of course, you need to go and make changes back to your order processing service. This, of course, is a form of coupling. All of these services are coupled together in some way. To add loyalty points in the system, the order processing service needs to make a call to the loyalty point service and say, here, can you add these loyalty points? And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the general rule of thumb in software, which is you want to aim for low coupling and high cohesion. And cohesion is a relatively straightforward one. You've also almost kind of solved that already. Cohesion is the idea that things that change together should live together. And you're already building microservices. You've already got these really nicely contained pieces of business functionality that are split up by domain. Coupling is a little bit more difficult, though. And that's because coupling is a lot more nuanced. There's lots and lots of different types of coupling. Whether that be technology coupling, are you using .NET, are you using Rust, are you using Java? Am I allowed to say Java? I'll say that. Yeah. There's location coupling. Where is a service that I need to talk to? What is the location of it? And you've got semantic and data format coupling. Are you using binary, XML, JSON? How do you handle null values? Are you using camel case, snake case? These are all different types of coupling. And it's coupling in a HTT-based 
HTTP-based microservice architecture that can start to cause you issues, because primarily you're dealing with runtime and location coupling. At the point your services run, you need to know the location of all the other services that you need to communicate with. And not only the location, you need to hope that the service you want to talk to is actually active at the point you need to talk to it. Coupling isn't all bad, though. If you completely decoupled all of your services, then no meaningful work would really get done. And there's an appropriate level of coupling to aim for. And I love this quote from Gregor. If you're not familiar with Gregor's work, Gregor is the author of Enterprise Integration Patterns, probably one of my favorite books on software, actually. And the appropriate level of coupling you want to aim for is related to the amount of control you have over the endpoints. And what I think Gregor means here is that if you're a team who are owning maybe two or three different microservices, coupling them services together tightly might not necessarily cause you as much of a problem. Because you own the release cycles, you own the SLAs, you own the schema of these APIs. But once you start integrating with a system outside of your control, you want to try and reduce that coupling as much as possible. And that might be another team inside your organization, that might be a third party API because now you don't control the release cycles, you don't control the SLAs, you don't control the uptime. So if they're the challenges that coupling gives us, why do we actually want to be event-driven? What benefit does that give you all? As of right now, you need to add this new loyalty point service. And to do that, you need to make changes to the order processing service, because you need the order processing service to make that call to tell the service to add the loyalty points. That means you need to get in the, into their backlog, into their sprint planning. And actually, you practice safe as an organization. So being really agile means you've got to wait three months for the next PI planning. Yes, we've all been there doing that. <laughs> so now you need to go and make these changes. You need to go and make these changes to this service. Actually, you don't control, but you need it to actually get any meaningful work done. And when you actually think about that, is it actually the right thing to do? Should the order processing service actually care about the fact people are collecting loyalty points? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. There's another challenge here, and that challenge is if the loyalty point service was to fail and you have this synchronous coupling, and this loyalty point service isn't something that's on the core domain, it's not something that means people can or can't get their pizzas. But if that was to fail, there's the potential this can have the knock-on effect of also causing your order processing service to fail. So now a service not on the critical path has caused the failure to something on your critical path. Now I realize I'm oversimplifying this massively. There are ways you can build synchronous systems that handle these problems. Circuit breakers, exponential backoff, proper error handling. Just because you are building a synchronous microservices system doesn't necessarily mean your system is gonna be unstable. What it does mean though, is that you're responsible for the constraints that another system has. You need to work around the constraints that the system you're calling imposes upon you. So like I said, we're gonna take this microservices architecture now and we're gonna make it event-driven. But before we do that, I just wanna level set to make sure we're all on the same page with a little bit of theory, and then we'll get back into the practical. Is anyone here working on an event-driven system today or has built one in the past? Okay, quite a few hands, that's good. Let's level set then, just to make sure we all are agreed on what these terms mean. That's where we are. So let's start with an event. What is an event? If it's events that are driving our system, what actually is an event? An event is an immutable fact. It's something that's happened in the past. It's something that cannot be changed. It's simply a notification that something has happened somewhere else. If you imagine you're here in Oslo, it's the middle of winter, it's dark a lot, and you need to get some light into the room that you're in, you need to do something in the room. So to do that, you're gonna hit the light switch. And that's gonna raise a light switched on event. The light is now on, that is irrefutable. It can't be changed. You can't unswitch on a light. All you can do is hit the light switch again, and that will raise a light switched off event. The light switched on, the light switched off. These things are irrefutable. They've happened. They cannot be changed. So if that's an event, what does it mean to be event-driven? And I actually think sometimes there's some terms that can get a little bit confused here. And that's the difference between being event-driven and event-based. 
both types of systems, both event-driven systems and event-based systems, are triggering functionality with events. The key difference with an event-driven system is that it's the business events that are triggering business functionality. The language of your system is fundamental to the functionality that happens in that system. Of course, events aren't a new thing in software. I started out in .NET building Windows Forms applications. Button clicked, mouse hovered, window resized, and then some functionality happened off the back of that. These are all examples of events. And even in more modern ways of building systems, if I upload a file to an Amazon S3 book bucket, there's your first AWS service name if you're keeping count, that will raise an S3 object created event. And I can choose to react to that if I want to. But these are all examples of technical events. This is an event-based system. An event-driven system is going to have events that look a little bit something like this. Order confirmed, pizza boxed, staff member clocked in. You could look at two businesses in the exact same domain, and they would probably have a completely different set of business events driving their functionality, because the language of these two businesses are going to be different. But they're probably all clicking buttons, uploading files, and resizing windows. And to come back to this same point again, an event-driven architecture lets you tell the story of your business through its technical implementation. Another thing you'll probably hear as you start to learn more about event-driven systems is that events are first-class citizens in your architecture. What does that even mean? What does it mean to be a first-class citizen in a system? How many of you are familiar with the idea of API-first design? Okay, a few hands, that's good. The idea of API-first design is that as you start to build an API or integrate systems together, the first thing you do is design the API. Before you write a single line of code, you agree on the contract that these two systems are going to use to communicate with each other. And when you're building an event-driven system, your events that you raise are your API. So therefore, to make events first-class citizens, you should start to practice event-first design. Your event schema is the contract you have between your services. It's the language that your services use to talk to each other. It's the language of your business that's driving the functionality. And when you're thinking about events, it's not as simple as just flinging around events. There's lots of different types of events that you're going to see. It's not just these little packets of JSON that are kind of sent around asynchronously. And actually, events are just one of the constructs that exist within message-driven systems. So let's first talk about the different types of messages. Commonly, you'll have commands, you'll have events, and you'll have queries in any system. And commands and events are very similar. The difference is mostly just a statement of intent. Am I telling a system to do something? Or am I, or am I reacting to something that happened in another system? And then, of course, of course, queries are one of the easiest ones. A query is all about just reading some data, getting a specific view of the world that a given system has. So you've kind of got this overarching set of messages. And then within, within events, you've got different types of events. Primarily, there are two different types of events that you're going to see. And the first is a notification event. A notification event is a really small, really lightweight packet of data. It's simply a notification that something has happened. Sometimes these are known as thin events. And this is actually where you start as you start to bring your event driven architecture into plant based pizza. You focus on this single integration between the order service and the kitchen service. So when an order confirmed event gets raised by the order service, that's when you know, as the kitchen service, you need to start preparing an order. So you receive this order confirmed event, this notification event, and you're like, excellent, I've got a pizza to make. What is actually on this order? The event doesn't actually contain any contents of the order that's been placed. So what you need to do now is you need to make a call back. You need to reach back into the order processing service to get the details of the order. So you've received this really small notification event, and you're going to reach back and get more information. And actually, all you've really done here is just shifted that synchronous communication around. Instead of the order service calling the kitchen service, the kitchen service now needs to call the order service. So is this really any better? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. The more subtle problem you have with this, though, is that because you've now got these events flying around, 
any other system in your organization can subscribe to these events. So maybe you add one more subscriber. Maybe three more systems decide that they want to get that event as well. They all decide to reach back. And then another one, and then another one, and then another couple, and then eventually your order processing service does this. Because you've got now a potentially infinite number of downstream systems that are all calling back, all trying to get more information about these orders. And you'll commonly hear this when you see anything about event-driven architecture. Services are unaware of their downstream consumers. And actually, I feel this is a bit of a dangerous statement because although you're unaware of what downstream systems are going to do with your events, you should be aware of them because you need to handle these kind of situations where systems might need to reach back. But of course, you're all incredibly smart developers and architects, so you think, is there a better way of doing this? Is there a different way we can handle this? And that leads us on to the second type of event that you'll commonly see. And that is event carried state transfer, otherwise known as a fatter event. So if this is the example of a notification event, and as you can see, it only includes the order ID. This is the order confirmed event. If you were to take this and change this to a fatter event, you'd end up with something that looks a little bit like this. And you'll notice now the state of the order is being carried as part of the event that's being raised. So now as the kitchen service, you know what items are on the order. You no longer need to make that callback to get more information about the order. So they're the two primary different types of events. Before we get a little bit further into the technical detail, let's just f to first talk about the ways messages move around in an event-driven system. And an event-driven system is primarily made up of three different components. You've got producers or publishers. You've got some kind of message channel in the middle, a bus or a topic or a stream. And then you've got a consumer or a subscriber at the other side. The primary integration pattern at work here is the publish-subscribe pattern. You're publishing events, and then you've got a number of subscribers all subscribing to these events. And you have different responsibilities if you're a producer or a consumer. As a producer, your responsibility is to stick to that contract you agreed. When you did that event-first design initially, you agree to try and stick to that wherever possible, to try not to introduce breaking changes. Where this gets really interesting, though, when compared to synchronous communication, is the things that you're no longer responsible for. Because now in an event-driven system, you're no longer responsible for the constraints that your consumer has. If you've ever, li ever hit rate limiting when calling a synchronous API, you no longer need to care about them kind of things. That's not your responsibility anymore. You don't need to care about the constraints of the systems that you're dealing with, you just publish events. And as long as you agree to stick to the contract you've agreed, you are fulfilling your role in the architecture. As a subscriber, you now need to protect against this kind of thing. Because if you just hook yourself directly up to the bus, to the message channel, and you now know that producers are just publishing events, you need to be really careful about how you handle these events. Much like when you're building an API, you have very little control over how many people are gonna call your API but you do implement things like rate limiting. We have these mechanisms in place when building APIs to protect ourselves. And you can have these same mechanisms when you're building an event-driven system. And as a subscriber in an event-driven system, I always recommend introducing some kind of storage layer between your compute, between your application, and the, and the bus itself. So we've got this central event bus that all the events are being published to, and instead of hooking your application directly to the bus, you're going to hook up some kind of queue. And that way, the events will come in, and they'll just build up and build up in the queue. And you can work through that queue at a time that suits you. And you'll notice I've drawn the boundaries of the system on here, because this queue is something that you control in your team. The bus is something shared. The queue is something you control. And that gives you that durability, that way to rate limit events that are coming your way. There's another slightly more subtle benefit of event-driven architecture. Because event-driven systems are built using business events, it really simplifies these conversations you can have with business people. How many of you have ever built a feature and then you've built that slightly wrong because there was a miscommunication somewhere along the line with the business? Okay, yeah, 
We've all been there, where business wants X, you build Y, and then you kind of try and realize why that went wrong. But because now you're talking about events, you're talking a language that the business people can understand, you can easily have these conversations. What should happen after an order is canceled? What should happen after an order is confirmed? The language you're now using to drive your functionality is something that everybody understands, as opposed to talking about REST and HTTP and SOAP and all these other technical terms. And that's, again, because EDA is fundamentally a communication pattern. It's a way of modeling the integration between systems. OK, let's get a bit more technical now. Let's start actually to work through the implementation of this. And we'll start with this core order processing flow. This is the bit we're going to make event-driven. And here's how it works today. An order comes in, and the order service makes a call to the kitchen. At some point later, the kitchen's going to make a call back to the order service and say, this, order, this kitchen, this, this order is now ready to be delivered. The order processing service will make a call to the delivery service. Delivery service responds when it's been delivered, and then the call goes out to the loyalty service. And the loyalty service says, we've added 10 points. And look at how much coupling you've got, how much synchronous communication you've got just for this simple piece of the architecture. So this is what you're going to take now, and we're going to make this event-driven. And the first question I normally get asked when I have this conversation is, how do I actually understand the events in my system? And there's something really useful in the same image that was on screen earlier. There's a process that's happening here. And that is the idea of event storming. Who's ever done an event storming workshop or knows what event storming is? OK. So we have. That's the another session on right now, which I'm sure is awesome. Thank you for being here with me, by the way. But there's a session on, on event storming. So catching that on YouTube afterwards is probably going to be a really good thing to do because this isn't going to be a deep dive on event storming. But if you're not familiar with event storming, what happens in an event storm is you get everybody in the room together, all the stakeholders, technical, non-technical. And the point in it is to understand the events that are happening in your business, to understand the language of your business. And it's really important that it's non-technical. And you will always get two developers off in the corner talking about how they're going to implement this with Kubernetes. The answer is don't use Kubernetes, by the way. But stop that conversation happening. This is not a technical discussion. This is a discussion where you want to agree the language of the business. It was popularized by Alberto Brandolini. And to quote directly from the event storming website, it's a way to design clean and maintainable event-driven software to support rapidly evolving businesses. And at the end of an event storming session, you'll end up with something like this. You'll have lots of post-it notes on the wall, everybody sticking on the events that happen in the business. And if you end up with multiple events that kind of mean the same thing, you'll cluster them together and you'll have a discussion about what the right language, what the right term is. Once you have all these events ready, you'll organize them by time to understand which events should happen in what order. And then you'll also start to put on the things that cause these events to happen, the commands that happen that cause an event to be triggered. And by the end of it, you'll have this big page of post-it notes, and everybody in the organization, technical, non-technical, everybody, understands the language to use in the system and what should understand, what should trigger what. So another one of the common things you'll hear when you learn about event-driven architecture is evolvability this core benefit of event-driven systems. It makes your systems evolvable. And that's kind of true, because you've got this central flow of events that are flying around now, and anybody can choose to hook into them at any time. And remember, services are unaware of their downstream consumers. But let's actually consider a real scenario here. Um, let's come back to this same fat event again, this order-confirmed event. And now, because you've all done such a fantastic job building out this architecture, it's scaled, and it's gone multi-region. So you now need to include the currency as part of this event. At the moment, it's just got the price, a decimal value. So you go off and you think, well, we can just add the currency, right? We can just change this event so that we add an order value. And we change that from being a decimal to be a type that has a value and a currency. Does anyone see a potential problem with us making that change? Some hands, some hands. Because remember, if anybody's using that order value, if anybody's using that decimal value, you've now just broken a system that you had no idea existed. And you might think, well, actually, it's only the kitchen service that's using this event, and they're not going to care about the order value. And then you realize that an analytics service has been spun up that you didn't know about that's using this event, and you've just broken a system you didn't even know existed. 
doesn't sound particularly evolvable, right? So what do we do now? How do we handle this? How do we manage this? And I'm going to put a word on screen now, and I apologize in advance. It's a really naughty word. It's a horrible word. I hate saying it. I hate this part of the talk, and it won't be there for long, I promise. And that word is governance. Yeah. Hard even to say it sometimes. It gives you the feeling of red tape and bureaucracy, right? It makes you think about these things that you can't do. You can't be agile. You can't move quickly. But actually, governance doesn't need to be painful. There doesn't need to be red tape to govern your systems. And in an event-driven system, you can use a process that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. And that's the idea of a request for comment, or an RFC. So whenever you want to make one of these breaking changes to an event, you raise an RFC, you tag that RFC with the type of event, you give everybody else in the organization the chance to comment on the change that you're thinking of making. And that keeps you asynchronous, it keeps your teams working independently, but it allows you to collaborate still as and when necessary. So that's one way you can add governance, but there's another way you can add governance at a technical level, down in the actual structure of your events. Because schema design is incredibly important in an event-driven system. The highest, yes, a question. Where does the RFC be an event? You raise an event when you raise the RFC. Yeah. Potentially, yeah, new RFC, that could work. That could work, there we are. <laughs> um, so at a technical level now, you've got this coupling at the schema level. The highest form of coupling you'll have in an event-driven system is the schema of the event itself. So what you should always do when you're building an event driven system is adopt some kind of consistent schema with your events. And there's actually a specification that exists exactly for this purpose. This is an example of the cloud events specification. And this is a defined spec for what an event should look like. And there's a few really important properties in here. The first is the data property. The data property is the actual event payload. This is what's going to be custom to every single event across your entire system. You've got the ID property. The ID is a uniquely generated identifier that's generated at the point of publish. And this allows downstream systems to implement things like item potency. They can look at an event and say, have I seen this event before? Yes, I have. I can drop it. I can ignore it. And then really importantly on this conversation around breaking changes, around evolvability, you've got the source and the type property. So the source property is where this event came from. This is our production order system. And then the type property is, of course, the type of event order created. And then you've suffixed that type property with a version number. And this is actually part of the cloud event specification. They recommend to use versioning as part of this. And what this allows you to do is to actually introduce breaking changes in a really safe way. So at the minute right now, you're publishing version one of this order confirmed event. And you want to introduce the breaking change. And what you'll do at this point, as opposed to completely overwriting that version one, you'll publish two versions of the same event at the same time. And at the minute, version two is extremely sad and upset because nobody cares about it. But you set a depreciation date on version one, and it's really important that you stick to the date that you set, because otherwise you'll end up managing lots and lots of versions of events. So you'll set a depreciation date, and you say on, on date, so many days or months in the future, we're going to stop publishing version one. And over time, all of your services will migrate over to version two, and you can stop publishing version one. So thinking about how you're going to evolve your schema over time is really important, because like I said, schema is the highest form of coupling in an event-driven system. And that brings us back to this question then. Should we use these fatter events? Or should we use these thinner, lightweight notification events? And at risk of sounding extremely cliched, of course, as you know, it always depends. I've gone back and forwards on this question so many times you wouldn't believe because there's benefits to doing both things. But as technologists, we love laws, don't we? We love heuristics, we love rules of thumb. And there's actually a law that can help us here. And that is Postel's law. Be conservative in what you do, be liberal in what you accept. It's also known as the robustness principle. And I want to focus in on the first part of this law. Be conservative in what you send. 
the less information you include in your event payload, the less coupling you have at a semantic level. And if you take this to the absolute extreme, we can end up back where we were initially, only publishing that order, the order ID as part of the event payload. And this might sound good in theory. We've got the thinnest possible event. We're only publishing the order ID. But then, of course, we have that same issue we had earlier where we need to do callbacks. But there's something in this idea of only publishing identifiers. What about if we were to publish an ever so slightly fatter event? where now we include the order ID, the delivery ID, and the customer ID. And if you actually think about how this would work, if you imagine you're on your phone now ordering a pizza, I'm really glad this is an after lunch session because otherwise this could go really badly. Imagine you're on your phone now, you're about to order a pizza. The first thing you're gonna do is add a delivery address. And if you think about the principles of microservices, each microservice should own its own data. So that delivery address information is going to be owned by the delivery service. And that delivery service is going to return back some kind of identifier, which you can store in session status somewhere in your app. And when you submit the order, you include that delivery ID as part of the order. So the order knows which delivery ID it relates to, but it doesn't actually need to know the specifics of the actual address information. So when this event gets published, the delivery service can consume that event and actually say, thank you very much. I've got a, I know which delivery address I need to use now. And there's another really interesting integration pattern that can help us here, and that's the claim check integration pattern. And the claim check pattern is a way of offloading some of this information. And I realize now that says enricher pattern, that is the wrong name, that should be claim check pattern. And it's a way of potentially avoid, avoiding some of these potential overloads that come from downstream systems. So with the claim check pattern, at the point of publish, you offload some of this information into a separate location. That might be a cache, temporarily. That might be another API that's built specifically for these callbacks. It might equally be a cloud service, something like Amazon S3, second AWS service name, if you're counting, by the way. Something like S3, which is durable, it's available, it's resilient, and you can pass an identifier to whereabouts in S3 that object is. So when the consumer receives this event, they can process it, and if they, don't, if they don't need any additional information, they can just process it as is, as a notification. If they do need more information, they can reach out and grab that additional information without actually overloading your core service. And whichever way you choose to do this, fat events, thin events, always embrace some kind of defined specification. Whether that's cloud events, there's another pattern called the metadata data pattern. This is becoming the de facto way of defining events in event-driven systems. So as you've seen over some of the last few diagrams, one of the things that you need to embrace as you build an event-driven system is asynchronicity. Struggle with that sometimes. You need to think about every part of your system now as interacting in an asynchronous way. And if you're used to using method calls or HTTP calls, these things where you've got request and response, this can be a paradigm shift. It was for me when I first started doing this. Because now your service is going to do a piece of work, and then it's going to publish in an event, and then maybe, hopefully, something else that you might want to happen is going to, hap is going to come back at some point in the future. If you think about this same integration we've been talking about, the order confirmed event gets published, and hopefully, probably, maybe at some point in the future, the order cooked event is going to come back. The order is ready to be do something else with it. But it might not. There's a chance it couldn't. And this is actually a problem with consistency. And there's two different types of consistency you see in distributed systems. There's eventual consistency and strong consistency. And to explain the difference between the two, I want to take a quick step into another part of plant-based pizza. And that's how payments work in plant-based pizza. So picture the scene, you can close your eyes if you want. Picture the scene, you've just walked into a pizza restaurant to collect your order, you can smell it, it's hit you in the face, you can see the pizzas being prepared behind the counter, you can see your pizza being put into a box, you're ready to take it, you're hungry, you're salivating. And before you can walk away with it, there's something you need to do first. Of course, you need to pay for your order. And there's two different ways you can choose to pay for your order, one of which is becoming an awful lot less common now. The first option you have is to pay with cash. You can take your purse or your wallet out. You can open it up. You can hand over some money to the cashier. They'll put that in the till, give you your pizza, and you go on your merry way. That's an example of, an, of a strongly consistent transaction. 
Because at that moment in time, you can absolutely guarantee that you no longer have the money and that the pizza restaurant has the money. Categorically, it's happened. It absolutely has happened. If you compare that to the other way that you can pay for your order, you could pay with a card. And if you pay for something with a credit card, all you're doing is making a theoretical guarantee that at some point in the future, the money is going to leave your bank account and go into their bank account. I'm sure you've all been there where you've bought something before. It might be a pizza. You've walked out and you've checked your bank statement and thought, I've just got a free pizza. This is wonderful. And that's an example of an eventually consistent transaction. At some point in the future, if everything stopped happening, if all money everywhere stopped moving for an hour, eventually every bank account would converge and have the same view of the world. And this is the same with distributed systems. If all events stopped publishing, eventually all the systems would have the same view of the world. And there's not really a solution for this if you're building event driven systems or distributed systems in general. In fact, you just need to embrace this idea of eventual consistency. As I'm sure many of you are aware, architecting systems is simply about balancing this big bag of trade-offs. And this is one of the trade-offs you'll have to make if you start to adopt an event driven system. And it's not just events that can be asynchronous. Commands can also be asynchronous. Imagine another scenario you need to implement now. Your order processing service wants to send an email. And you could do that using asynchronous request response. You could make a call from the order processing service. The email, email service would send the email and then respond back again. But now you're in that same situation where something that's not core to your business domain, sending emails in more systems is an ancillary kind of nice to have. And if that email service is offline, it has the potential to cause your order processing service to come offline. An email is something that doesn't really change very much either. You have the same set of properties from, to, body, subject. So the first way you could implement this in an event-driven system is, of course, to have your email service react to the different events. Your order service could publish an order confirmed event, and then the email service is going to say, I know I need to send an email when I see an order confirmed event. And this is a perfectly valid way of building this, but then this becomes a problem of responsibility. Because now your email service needs to know about all the different events that it needs to send an email for, and exactly what the contents of that email should be, when really the responsibility of the from and the to and the subject of the bot and the body should really be the responsibility of the service that wants to send the email. And this is where asynchronous commands can help. Because you can send commands, you can do these statements of intent in an asynchronous way. The email service might expose some kind of endpoint. That might be a queue, that might be a topic, but it's something, a message channel, that every other service can send a message to. And the order processing service is going to send a send email command onto that topic, that endpoint exposed by the email service. And now the order processing service can go on and do something else. It can carry on with its day. And you'll notice that payload still follows that cloud events specification. That, then the, the email service can take the messages from that channel, go off and send the email. And you'll notice in that event body, there's also a field for the response channel. And a response channel is a way, as a producer, to get some information back. You might define a queue or some kind of endpoint that you want the email service to call back to if you need a response from your command. So as the service sends the email, it can then call back to the response channel if that is something you need. Typically, in an email scenario, you're probably not going to need that response back unless it's an absolutely critical email. So commands can be asynchronous as well. That does risk offending the purists of event-driven architecture in the world, but it can be an asynchronous thing as well. So now you're in this really nice situation. You've got this system that is now event-driven. You've taken all these different points of integration. You've moved them from synchronous communication to something more event-driven. And then your business throws another spanner in the works. They say, this loyalty point service that you've put blood, sweat, and tears into building, we now want to replace that with a third-party API. We want someone else. We're going to buy a product that's going to manage your loyalty points for us. And you get really sad for a little bit. And then you think, actually, how do we integrate with that? Because all of our systems are event-driven, but now we need to integrate with this API that isn't event-driven. It's a third party. And one of the options here is, of course, to go back to how you had it originally. You could let the order processing service make the calls to the third-party API, but then you're back in that same situation 
where you are now dealing with the constraints of that third party. So what I always recommend in this scenario is still keeping some element of loyalty point service. You keep a small, really lightweight service that's simply there just to make these calls to the third party API. It will receive the events of your bus and it'll act like a kind of proxy to make the calls out to the third party. And it can even publish events back onto the bus if the, if the request to the third party is successful or not. This is particularly helpful for legacy systems. If you're integrating with some kind of legacy monolith that only exposes a HTTP API, you can still start to make other parts of your system event-driven and use a pattern like this to add that element of rate limiting because you've got a queue in there and still keep these calls back to your monolithic application. Another thing to be really careful about with event-driven systems is observability. How do you actually work out what the heck is going on when something breaks? And there's probably a whole nother talk on this topic, on observability in event-driven systems. But there's one small change you can make to that event schema to set yourself up for success in this scenario. If you come back to that schema design from earlier, and again, this is part of the cloud events specification, there's two additional properties in here now. There's a trace parent and a trace state. This is assuming that you're using open telemetry in this case. You, this could equally just be a correlation ID. The point is, though, you're passing a consistent identifier between all of these different events. And then you can start to look at cause and effect. You can start to look at actually this event happened that then caused this event and this event to happen. And you can link that all together under one single distributed trace. The other slightly the other good benefit to this is that coming back to that versioning conversation from earlier, if you've got these trace identifiers being passed around, you've implemented distributed tracing, you can start to annotate traces with the version number of the event that you've consumed. And that way, as a producer, you can start to look in your observability backend and look at, OK, how many different systems are still consuming version one of my event? Who do I need to go and shout at or hit with a really big stick to make them move to version two? So observability is really important. And setting yourself up for success in this way is where I would always recommend starting. And the final part of this now is to talk about boundaries. Because although you're now prioritizing asynchronous communication, at some point, somewhere, you're probably going to need something synchronous. The example that always comes back here is some kind of front-end application. If you've got a front-end that needs to make a call and all of your back-end is asynchronous and event-driven, how do you actually get that working? And I'm a really big fan of having these really thin, really lightweight, synchronous API layers at the boundaries of your system. So when this submit order request comes in, you're going to do a really small amount of validation. Maybe you just check that there's more than zero items on the order, but you do a little bit of validation just to check that the request that comes in is OK. And then you store that in a database and publish an event onto the bus. And all of your hard work, all of the stuff that needs to happen in the background, is then happening asynchronous. But you've got this really thin synchronous layer that you can use to actually manage this communication with front ends or maybe systems that can't be event driven. And the logical problem that then leads you to ask is, how do I then get something back to my front end? Because if all the business functionality is happening asynchronously in the back end, the front end has already had a response from your API. It's already doing other things. But of course, you've still got events flying around. After the kitchen service does some work, it's going to publish an order prepared event. The order's ready, the order's been prepared, the order's ready to, to complete, whatever. So the order service can, of course, consume that event that's going to come back, and it can use that event to update the state of the order in the database. So that means when your front end then makes another call to get the state of an order, it has the most up-to-date state. The alternate pattern you have here is to use something like SignalR, WebSockets, some kind of bi-directional communication, so that you can consume these events as they come back in and push them straight out to the front end. But this pattern we're talking about here, this having your events come back in and updating a view of the world, this leads us to another architectural pattern that does work well with event-driven systems. It's not a necessity when you're building event-driven systems, and that is command query responsibility segregation, or CQRS. Is everyone familiar? Is anyone familiar with CQRS? Everyone, has everyone implemented CQRS 
how well did it go? <laughs> and it's, it's a difficult pattern. It's a, it's a challenging pattern to work with. And I think it's sometimes used in places that it might not need to be. But the idea of CQRS is that you separate the command part of your system, the part of your system that handles writes and mutations. And you separate that from the query part of your system. And these are completely independently deployable systems. What that might look like is the create order request comes into your API, and that gets published onto some kind of bus, so the order created event, for example. And of course, all your backend systems are going to go off and start doing work with that order created event. But you've also got your query service, your order processing query service, that's also interested in that order created event. And that's going to update a read model, a viewer, a query database. And this is a database that's optimized purely for handling queries. And of course, this sounds in practice like a simple pattern. But thinking back to them ideas of consistency, of the fact that an event might not get to the place you think it does, this can cause you issues. It's a pattern that's really intended for when you've got a write that have a lot of complex business logic. If you need to do a lot of work on write, but your queries are really simple, really easy, this can be a good place to start. But in a lot of cases, it's probably not a pattern that you're going to need. But let's actually walk through how this would actually work if you were to adopt this event-driven CQRS-based system in plant-based pizza. So the submit order request comes into your order processing API. It publishes an order confirmed event. And that order confirmed event is consumed by both the kitchen service and the query service inside your order processing domain. After some time, the kitchen service is going to finish creating the order, and it's going to publish an order prepared event. And that order prepared event is then going to be consumed by the delivery service to go off and organize the delivery of the order, and also consumed by the query service of the order processing service to then update the state, update the view of the world. And that means when your get order request comes in, that can be really, really fast because you've got this view of the world that's been pre-computed. There's one last challenge I wanted to touch on with this kind of architecture, and it's focused on this piece here. Because when this post, this submit order request comes in, the order service is going to store that somewhere. It's going to store that order somewhere, and then it's going to publish the event to the event bus. But what happens in a scenario where your event bus is offline? What happens in a scenario where that event can't be published? Because now your order processing database knows about the order, but nobody else does because it's never reached the event bus. And there's a couple of different patterns that can help you here. The first, and probably the simplest really, is the transactional outbox pattern. In an outbox pattern, when you write some data to your primary database table, you also write it to typically another table that's called something like outbox. And you wrap both of them writes in a transaction. So if either one fails, neither of them will happen. And then you've got some kind of separate service that's simply polling the outbox table. It's looking for all the events in the outbox table that haven't yet been published. And it will go off and publish them as and when it's ready. And this means if your event bus is offline, whatever service you're using, these events will just build up and build up. But can you, you can even start to have metrics and alarms on the size of your outbox table of your unpublished events to then know if you've got a real problem in your system. So this is one way you can manage this. You can use a transactional outbox. You can also use change data capture to kind of help you here. If you are familiar with change data capture, that's a place where you can write data to your database and actually stream the changes to your database out the back of your database. And then you can hook into that stream of data to actually start publishing these events. So this is another pattern. The outbox is, in some cases, easier and better to work with, really. But one of the benefits in working in this way, though, is that you can make your query model, your read model, incredibly performant. Because the create order request is going to come in, and that's going to get written to your primary database. And importantly, this database is the source of truth. If you're ever looking at the current state of a system, it will always be the database linked to your command system. And then that event goes off, and that event gets published onto the bus and consumed by your query service. And your query service can create this really highly optimized read model. This could even be a cache. I've built a system in the past where the queries needed to be incredibly high performance and the writes were really complex. So instead of having the query system be a database, it was simply a cache. So when that get 
order request comes in, it responds incredibly quickly. And if that was to go away, you can simply rehydrate that cache from the command database, which is your primary data store. So to close out, we've talked a lot about some theoretical fictional company there, right? About plant-based pizza. What happens if you actually want to go away now and start building an event-driven system? And the advice I always give is to start small. Don't try and make your entire system event-driven overnight. Pick one area, pick one small integration and get that right. And don't pick a completely meaningless service that nobody ever uses, but equally don't pick your tier zero cannot go offline service. Pick something kind of in the middle somewhere. Start with this small integration point. And start to add messaging to your system. Even if you're building a monolithic application today, start publishing events. When state changes in your system, start publishing events. And even though nobody's hooking into them today, then you have the potential in the future to start making things event-driven. If you have a new service, a new feature, a new piece of functionality you have, because you've got these events flying around, you can then start to hook into them and make things event-driven. Because remember, event-driven architecture is fundamentally a communication pattern. It's a way of modeling the integration between systems. It's a technical communication pattern, but it's also a useful communication pattern at a business level. The language you use to talk about your system is incredibly important to the success of the system. Remember, language and words are what got us to where we are today as a species. And at least for the moment, while software development is still a human endeavor, these words and stories are incredibly important. And event-driven architecture allows you to bring them words, them stories, into your actual system. And of course, event-driven architecture isn't a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all of your problems. What I hope you've taken from this talk is some really practical advice that you can use to go away and not make the same mistakes that I did. Thank you all very much for listening.